So I'm a, yeah, I'm a hacker, and um, nothing bad has ever happened to me. <laughs> um, so I'm working on trying to uh, import problems from other places and work on those. Um, I want to show you a little bit about how hackers think. Um, this is a buddy of ours named Sammy. Um, Sammy served three years for crashing MySpace with a virus that he was using to try and pick up chicks by uh, changing all their pages to say, Sammy is my hero, and uh, automatically adding them as his friend on MySpace, which uh, got him over, like, over a million friends in under 24 hours, which is pretty cool. But Sammy's allowed to use a computer again. Anybody here use this uh, Maps program? Sammy figured out that the way Google knows about the traffic is that your phones report what's going on as you're driving around. And so he started just sending fake data to Google Maps that says, you know, there's a lot of people on the roads that I'm about to drive on. <laughs> so what Sammy does, <laughs> just for fun, you know, um, the reason I'm telling you about Sammy, and I wish I had more time to tell you more about hackers, is he has a different kind of brain than you do. His brain is a really important natural resource, and we're using it for all the wrong things, right, clearly. An example I've used before is if you get a new gadget and show it to your mom or your grandma, she might ask you, well, what does this do? And you can explain. Well, it's like an iPhone you stick on your head, Mom. And she would understand that, right? But if you give a new gadget to Sammy, which actually happens all the time, the question is different. The question is, what can I make this do? And he'll take all the screws out, break it into a lot of little pieces, and then figure out what he can build from the rubble, right? That discovery process is fundamental to invention. It's fundamental to innovation. That is where every new thing we ever get comes from. And you can't skip that part, or you don't get anything new. So what's going on now is humans are running this grand experiment. We're trying to figure out every day how do we keep more people alive on just one planet? More people? no additional planets. And that only thing that we can do is invent our way out of this. And so we're trying to find ways to scale up invention. This is a protocol diagram that hackers would use. It's for a crypto system that's built into your web browser. What hackers will do is attack every point in this protocol, right? What happens if I send a date from the future? What happens if I send two responses instead of one? What happens if I send a zero instead of a one? I might get a computer to break. And if I can get it to break in one way, maybe I can get it to break in some other way, like a way that makes you my friend on MySpace or Facebook, <laughs> or gives me your credit card number, or maybe does something more constructive. This is Anopheles Stefenzi. She's a female mosquito carrying malaria in Africa. And she kills about a million people a year, half of them are kids under five, right? And this is a protocol diagram for malaria. It spends some of its lifetime in humans, some of its life in a mosquito, it's very complicated, we don't actually understand everything about how this works. But what I do in the lab where I work is I hire hackers to attack every point in this protocol and we try to figure out how can we intervene? How can we stop that? How can we solve a problem that's big? This is the old-fashioned way of going after malaria. We just spray chemicals that kill everything, right? You hope some of the good stuff comes back. This is a real ad from like the 40s where we were teaching kids to sing the DDT is good for me. <laughs> it's not actually good for you. <laughs> um, <laughs> still an important part of how we're going to attack malaria, you know? but we're trying to add tools to the arsenal and figure out how to deal with that. So one of our crazy ideas was, um, what if we could find mosquitoes with computers and shoot them down with laser beams? Which sounds like fun. Um, 
pretty much whatever your problem is, we have a solution involving laser beams. So this is us tracking mosquitoes in real time. Um, and what we do is we use a computer to sample their wing beat frequency. We can go to the next video. And what they do, this is a, is a mosquito we lit up with an ultraviolet laser, so she's not coming back. Um, this is very satisfying stuff, because not even PETA comes to save mosquitoes. Like, you can kill as many as you want. <laughs> so, you know, um, people with guns, let's just give them lasers and let them go after mosquitoes. It'll be fine. Uh, this is kind of before we tuned our lasers and we just <laughs> totally vaporizing mosquitoes, which is also rewarding and fun. But, um, but the point is, what's going on here is that we've used computers and we've taken the advancements that Moore's Law gave us. We compute the value of the life of every individual bug before we shoot it down. That's unprecedented for humans, right? We've never had that kind of computation to throw around, and now we do. And we, our imaginations are not keeping up. You have a supercomputer in your pocket, and you're using it to play like, you know, fart apps or, you know, dots or something. You know, this is not the limit of what we can do with these computers. We're at the beginning of figuring it out. I'm not going to go into more detail on this, but the rough idea is we put lasers on fence posts around a building or a village and shoot mosquitoes as they fly towards humans. Eventually, we realized, oh, we could protect crops, too, with an organic photonic pesticide. Um, it's all kinds of possibilities. But this is, again, just, we just cheat at invention by using Moore's Law to scale others haven't tried yet. So this is all taking place in our lab. This is our machine shop. The lab is called the Intellectual Ventures Lab. And what we do is we try to take on the biggest problems we can find. Um, our business model's a little different because we don't make any products. We just work on invention. I mean, we can prototype things here. Um, we basically just bought one of every tool in the world, hired one of every kind of scientist. This is our warehouse. There's another 8,000 tools that don't fit in the lab, but I can have them, you know, in a couple hours if I need them for a project. And that's a way of cheating at invention and being faster. So I'm going to show you a couple quick things that we work on. Cubic mile of oil. Earlier today, you heard that a cubic mile is enough space to hold all the humans on Earth. That's a huge amount. Well, a cubic mile of oil is how much energy we used in about the year 2000, right? This is what we use today, three and a half cubic miles of oil. That's how much energy we use. Some of it's coal, but... If we keep on with what we're doing, and we enact all of our brilliant policies for reducing energy consumption, we only need an additional 1.8 cubic miles uh, by 2035, right? If we do a really great job and reduce our energy consumption a lot, we only need 1.4. Pretty good, huh? We need a lot of energy. We need a lot of energy. This is how much energy we need by 2050 because we're going to run out of oil and coal. We've got to come up with other ways of getting this. It's a lot. More than people ever visualize. These guys are useful. You know, that seems like a free way to get energy. I mean, it's modulo the cost of building windmills. But if you take those guys, windmill turbines, state-of-the-art turbines, and you put them over the entire, all the flyover states, then you get one cubic mile of oil worth of energy. And then what happens? You're going to run out of space, and they're going to end up in your backyard, right? So, you know, we love windmills, but think about what's going to happen when it's not just in your neighbor's backyard. So this gets kind of interesting. It turns out we've got this amazing shit right here, that can the size of a Coors Light has 1.8 million times the energy density of oil, right? That can is worth 120,000 barrels worth of oil and energy. If you sat at a gas station and put gas in your Prius and let it run and run until the bill was $12, 000, $12 million, that's how much energy we have in one can of uranium. It's pretty good stuff but we don't know how to use it in a way that we're happy with. This is what happens. We dig that stuff out of the ground, we put it through a complicated enrichment program, and we end up with all this nuclear waste. 
right? Stockpiles of nuclear waste. And what's going on is we, after we enrich that fuel, we get 0.7% of the energy out. The other 99.3% is sitting in nuclear waste stockpiles because, well, frankly, the process is fairly inefficient. So we invented a new type of nuclear reactor that's powered by nuclear waste. We take the stuff from the stockpile, we put it in our reactor, and that fuel gets enriched inside the reactor and burned inside the reactor. And it's a lot more efficient. This is neutron bombardment, which I'm sure is rudimentary to everyone in the room, so we're going to skip that because we're running out of time. Um, but going back to my fake pie chart here, if I burn that fuel in my reactor, I get all the other energy out, right? And that's worth doing. That's worth figuring out. We don't have a lot of people trying to invent new types of nuclear reactors, and we need a lot more. We have hardly any competition in this right now. We're the only ones, and that's not very cool. Our team is made up of like these old guys who we pulled out of retirement that were interns on the first generation of reactors 50 years ago, and then some like young guys who just got their degrees and think it's cool. There's no one in the middle. Nobody's been working on this stuff. We need to work on this stuff. Um, this stockpile in Kentucky has 700,000 metric tons of depleted uranium. If we burn that stuff in our reactors, we can power the entire planet, including growth, for about 1,000 years. And we don't even have to dig up more uranium. That is wasteful. So remember these guys? Not any, anybody here today from, the, from that? No? OK. Well, <laughs> see if you can find yourself on this chart. <laughs> All right. <laughs> um, so the interesting thing is, these guys, um, including all of us, you know, you get, look, we all won, OK? You're the winners. That's why you're here hanging out with me. It's exciting. Uh, but since you won, you have a grave responsibility, OK? as do I. Like I said at the beginning, I don't have any actual problems of my own. Let's go find some to work on. So these guys are the top 14% globally, OK? You and me and all the 99% sleeping on the streets in Manhattan, top 14. They won too. Top 14, that's pretty good. If you remember Malcolm Gladwell's chart, you know, the top 14% in a school, that's the pool you want to hire from. Not too bad, right? So what we think is that you know, we don't need more fart apps for the iPhone. What we do need is to take on the bigger problems that humans have. And you guys should be doing that. Um, this is a big problem that humans have. We take vaccines, we put them in a $2 styrofoam cooler, truck them across the Sahara, and start injecting kids. And we get about a 50% failure rate. A quarter million people a year die this way. Right? So um, we invented this thing. It's kind of a super thermos. You take that, you put vaccines in it, you truck it across the Sahara, and um, it'll keep vaccines cold for months on end with no external power. There's no actual way to plug this in. It doesn't have a power jack. You guys can come and play with it afterwards if you want. It just stays cold. I ship them to Africa, and they come back cold just stays cold. So that's a way of keeping vaccines cold and not having to worry about it. These things keep vaccines cold for four hours. And we just inject kids with vaccines gone bad. That doesn't work. So the last thing I'm going to show you real quickly, this is a, an antenna, pipe organ. Right? Each of those antenna make a different frequency. So high frequency little antennas, big antennas make low frequencies. That's an, you could think of as a big old analog antenna. The way we made music was analog until we came up with these guys. What's that? That's a pile of computer chips. And what does it do? It synthesizes all the sounds you can make with those antenna and more, right? Computers took over. All your music's made that way. So 
we've been working in an area of science that's kind of new called metamaterials. These are materials that don't exist in nature, but that we can manufacture. So one of the problems we started attacking is if you've got a satellite dish on the ground, that's what these domes on boats are, or that dish in a predator drone, it's a physically steerable dish so that you can aim it at a um, satellite and talk to it, right? That's big and heavy and expensive. If there's a LEO satellite whizzing by, you have to have a steerable dish on the ground to talk to it. So what we did is we invented this new type of antenna. It's a flat panel. I'll show you. Looks kind of like that. But it can electronically steer a beam with no moving parts, right? We actually I brought one of the, this is like the commercial product we're working on. So this thing can steer a beam and aim at a satellite dish. This is a way of getting gigabit wireless to everyone on the planet. Right now, every satellite we put up is an LEO satellite. It's got more communications capacity than the entire network did last year. But we can't talk to them without these big, heavy mechanical dishes. I can duct tape that to the side of a building. It'll find satellites and track them. That's a way to scale wireless infrastructure beyond what we can imagine the way we do it now. So um, anyway, I'm running out of time. I'm going to get out of here. Thanks so much. I'll be around if folks want to come chat afterwards.